Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar. This is Jesse Roy at the Agency of Education. I am the Assistant Director of um, the Federal Education Support Programs team. And I am uh, Josh Sulier. I am the Assistant Director of the Education Quality Division. In the room as well with us today are Patrick Halliday, uh, who is the Director of Josh's Division, as well as Ann Bordenero, who directs my division. Um, and they're maybe going to chime in here and there to help out. They're going to sort of man the phone lines if there are any questions that come in through the chat. Um, but the four of us are here, and we're excited to have you here. And with that, we're going to get started. Would someone please um, quickly type into the chat if they're able to hear me? Just always nice to know that the message is going out to the field. <laughs> Uh-oh. Do you have to do the star one thing here? That was original star one. I'm going to switch over to the audio. <clears throat> Nobody heard what we said. I'm going to get in response. Uh-huh. I'm going to step out to my desk and dial in this way and see if I can hear you guys. Sure. Oh, they can hear you. Okay, we are good to go. Thanks, guys. It uh, it appears in a different part, not a chat. All right, so brief early technical issues aside, let's get started. Screen here. <clears throat> All right, so the purpose of today's webinar is to walk you through <coughs> some updates to the CIP and CFP application submission process. Um, hopefully nothing earth shattering, but things that you all should be aware of as you continue working on your CIPs and you prepare for next year's CFP application. So here is what I have on tap for today. So topics today, we're going to walk through a new tool to the field called the data inventory tool. Um, so we'll briefly give um, a description of what the tool is, and we'll also walk through what the tool looks like and describe how you would go about filling in the tool. Then we're going to give you some rationale. This is sort of a new ask. Um, it's probably not a novel ask in, in other ways. You know, you're probably expecting this. You're probably doing a lot of this good work already. But we'll talk you through a little bit why the CIP team, why the EQ team needs this tool to be filled in, and why on the side of the CFP application, we also need this tool to be completed. We're then going to talk about some updates to the CIP process. Um, Josh Tulier is going to walk you through um, a new rubric for evaluating your submissions and also talk about how submissions will occur this year. And then finally, we'll walk through a timeline um, of sort of all the expectations and requirements in terms of CIP submission and application opening and all those good things. So data inventory tool, the CIP template, and review, and then finally, the timeline. So the data inventory tool. So the data inventory tool, tool is going to precede your work on the continuous improvement plan and ultimately your CFP application. This is going to be a place for you to collect the data that you're going to analyze um, before beginning your continuous improvement planning process. It's going to be a place to summarize early key findings and the sources of data that you're going to use to inform your planning and ultimately your CFP application. Um, the requirement this year is that it's completed and submitted, um, and that's going to be each year for the LEA as well as each school, sort of similar to your continuous improvement plan. There will be a data inventory submitted for each LEA and for each school within the LEA. So I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of the tool. I'm going to switch screens quickly. Um, and you probably have a sense of sort of what I'm talking about, but we're going to go through it section by section just to show you basically what the ask is going to be in terms of filling it out. All right. So here's the introduction of the data inventory tool. I'm not going to walk you through it. We're going to talk about the rationale for it in a little bit. But the first page basically describes um, sort of why the data inventory tool, how you're going to go about filling it out and sort of what the expectations are. Further down the tool, we get right into part one. Part one um, is comprised of four sections, each section representing the education quality standards. Um, academic proficiency is represented, personalization is represented, safe, healthy schools, and high quality staffing. This first section, academic proficiency, is where a school or LEA would enter their data and initial findings in the five domains for academic proficiency described in the education quality standards. So you've got math, English language arts, science, English language proficiency, and global citizenship. The ask here is that you describe the sources used in your initial data analysis, 
when exploring these domains. And then you give a summary and initial analysis or key findings of the data that you explored with your team. That's going to be similar in terms of a process for personalization. You can see the section looks very different. Again, you're going to give your sources and then you're going to summarize your findings. Safe and healthy schools. And we've given some suggested data that you look at. And then high quality staffing. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the IFR process, you'll notice that this largely parallels what you've seen through that process, what you've read in EQS. What's not included in here is investment priorities. It was a little less pertinent to sort of this process, so, so only those first four domains are the ones you're going to be responsible for in this pool. The second part are specific sections of data collection and analyses that will support your CFP investment writing. Um, again, I'll get a little bit into the rationale and why this ask is now being brought forward. Um, but quickly to go through the tool, you're going to cover Title I, II, and IV in your data analysis in this tool with specific considerations under each. So the first part is Title I, and the first consideration, as you can see on the screen, is of needs of students most at risk to not meet challenging state standards. It's going to be a very similar format to what you've done above. And in fact, a lot of the data you end up submitting in these parts is going to be duplicative of data that you presented above. Um, as you can see here under potential data sources, it just references your academic proficiency data might be one source you use. Your safe and healthy schools data is going to be another source you use. This can largely be cut and paste, but should include some analysis that will explain exactly how you're supporting the intent of Title I with this data. So the first title is one consideration is the needs of students most at risk. There's parent and family engagement needs that need to be explored. That's a requirement for your application under Title I. The needs of students experiencing homelessness, also required under Title I. There's that mandate it's set aside each year, and you need to have investments to support those kids, so some data to support those investments. The needs of your English learners, and that'll bring us to Title II. Title II, as most of you are aware, is largely concerned with professional development, so similar to the last section and the sections that preceded that, you're going to list potential data sources explored or the, or the data sources that you've explored, as well as an initial findings and analysis below. So Title II considerations would be professional development needs, needs around teacher evaluation and feedback, and then needs around recruiting, hiring, and retaining effective teachers. And again, potential data sources are given under each of these headings. You're going to list those data sources used and then your brief analysis. Title IV is the third and final section under Part II. Um, the intents of Title IV include promoting well-rounded educational opportunities, promoting safe and healthy students, and finally, promoting the effective use of technology. So that's the data inventory tool very quickly. Um, again, there's some rationale and description at the top for why and sort of how to use this tool. Um, and again, this will be a required submission each year for each LEA and each school within the LEA, along with your continuous improvement plan to sort of kickstart that process as well as to support your CFP application. And right, I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint. <coughs> All right, so in terms of how you're going to submit the tool, there is a tab in the Continuous Improvement Plan section of GMS where you will simply upload the tool when completed. So fairly straightforward. Um, you can see a picture of it here. It's not dissimilar to other upload sections that you've seen in the Continuous Improvement Plan or CFP application. Um, so data inventory is simply an upload, um, which will allow you to continue working on it um, back in your LEAs or back at your schools. You can make updates to it as needed, um, maybe to support new investments or maybe when new data becomes available. So we thought an upload was probably the easiest way to allow you the flexibility of continued work in this data inventory um, as needs arise in your LEA or schools. So here's some of the rationale, and I've alluded to some of it already. Um, so as most of you probably know, a comprehensive needs assessment and a formal plan being developed are requirements under many of the titles in the Every Student Succeeds Act. So, so part of this, this ask is being driven by statute. As I alluded to earlier, it supports the writing of high quality investments that are clearly aligned to data. Um, most of you have now heard from my team, maybe in last year's training or through some documents you found online or feedback you've received during the course of the year, that a clear statement of purpose is half of your investment description. 
And that clear statement of purpose basically aligns what the ask is in the investment to what the data has shown is your local need. Um, here are some examples. In order to improve informational text comprehension, informational text comprehension, we will, and then your proposed spending. Or in order to decrease behavior referrals in non-classroom settings, we will, and then the description of the activities you'd like to fund. Just continuing with the rationale, it provides a secondary opportunity, which is supplemental to the continuous improvement plan to explore needs specific to the intents of the title funds. So some of the feedback we received in the past is, or some of the questions we received in the past was, you know, how do I fit everything I want to do in my CFP application into this continuous improvement plan that's supposed to be pretty specific, that's supposed to be identifying some, a handful of, of high leverage priority goals for my district and some in-depth work we want to do around those things. I'm trying to make this plan fit all of my CFP needs at the same time. Well, this inventory was designed to sort of meet that need where you can continue to focus in your CIP plan on some very targeted goals while also getting your investment needs met by having this inventory as a place where you can really tackle those intents of the titles. You can provide the data, you can describe some in-depth analysis that leads you to believe what strategies might be most effective versus trying to stick it all in the CIP plan. We found in the past that the SIP didn't always support investments well enough, but also sometimes that folks were trying to stick everything in the SIP in order to make sure they get all their investments approved. This is going to kind of be a supplemental opportunity for you to really dig into the intents of the titles and leave the continuous improvement plan to really be the place where you focus on some of those sustained high priority goals and objectives um, around improvement in your buildings. Um, what this also allows us to do, I think by providing <coughs> you with an opportunity to provide some more detailed data specific to the titles, is it enables us on the CFP side to engage in a more stringent review than we've been able to engage in in the past. Um, you know, there have been times this year, and some of you may have gotten this feedback, where there hasn't been quite enough in your continuous improvement plan to support the investments that you had proposed in your, in your CFP application. You know, that leaves you in a tough spot. That leaves us in a tough spot. We want to be able to support you in the most effective and efficient spending and compliance spending that we can, which means we really need to see the data <coughs> that supports those statements of purpose and ultimately supports those investments. Um, you know, it prevents against this allowed cost. It really streamlines the process of approval for us. It makes sure that your applications are approved more quickly. If we can see exactly what those connections are between your local data and the things you'd like to do in your application. So this is another place where that can happen and we can review with a little more of a sharper eye. Um, a question that inevitably will come up, you know, following this conversation is, do specific investment strategies need to be described in the inventory? No, they don't. But strategy, strategy should be clearly supported by specific data and findings. Um, so for example, let's say you've got a general need around math proficiency. You know, you can demonstrate that pretty quickly with sort of an aggregate statement about your SBAC scores. Then when you go to your CFP application and you'd like to maybe engage in TLCs to work on vertical alignment of curriculum, that might not be clearly articulated in just SBAC data. There may be an opportunity for you to provide more data, maybe walkthrough data, maybe some teacher survey data, maybe some local comprehensive assessment system data, that might support not only that you have a need in math, but that you have a need to align the curriculum that is going to in turn support your investments. So dig a little deeper in this inventory tool to really support exactly what you want to do in your investments, but you don't have to list specific strategies. All right, let's stop for a second before I turn it over to Josh to talk about sort of the CIP side of this. And um, Patrick's maybe going to share with me some questions that have popped up. One question, Jesse, that we were thinking about that you mentioned that um, the title section of this might be a little bit duplicative. The title section of the data inventory might be a little bit duplicative with some of the, the, the top sections. Yep. Does that mean when it's appropriate that cutting and pasting from the top into the bottom is is allowed? Yep. So, so I think it's a great question. I think it is allowed. Um, you can cut and paste what would ultimately be duplicative information. But I'm going to go back to the same thing I said just a minute ago. Ultimately, if you have specific investments that you want to write based on your data, the data should be nuanced enough. It should be specific enough to support those, those directions you want to go with your spending. So back to that sort of math example. You know, you may cut and paste SBAC scores from your top section into your Title I section. Tell me a little more about why a PLC is going to be the most appropriate course of action. You don't need to list PLC specifically in your data inventory. But if you've got an issue with aligned curriculum, 
that probably should come through in your data. You know, why are you having issues with your math scores? Give me a little more in the data so when I look at your investments, I can say, yep, that's clearly aligned to what they've shown me in their data inventory. That's all that's come in at this point, please. If you have questions, go ahead and enter them into the question field and we will address them when we have uh, we have breaks in the presentation. Yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe jump ahead to another question that I think might come up and maybe Josh was gonna touch on this. Mm -hmm. There are lots of folks already doing this work. They've got various protocols they use in data collection and to kickstart their CIP planning or to support their CFP investments. You may have a data inventory. It may be very similar to the one that I've presented today, it may be very different. If you have a data inventory that you think fits the bill, you may choose to upload that instead of using the one we're providing. But just a word of caution, the data inventory that we designed was very specific to the needs we had in mind in terms of continuous improvement planning, as well as supporting CFP investments. We, as I said before, are gonna do a more stringent review of both those things. If it's not well supported in the data in the inventory that you've uploaded, your CFP investment, your priority goal on the, the CIP application, we're going to come back to you and say, we need more from you. We need more sections in your inventory. We need more specific data in those sections. So just be aware that while you may have an inventory that, that you prefer, it may not fit all the needs that we see on our side. So maybe crosswalk it with what we're asking. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Um, thank you for listening to me. <coughs> Uh, and I just wanted to say briefly that uh, we will have time for questions, as Jesse stated, at the end of today's webinar. Uh, we will also have an AOE representative at next week's TIFLA meeting, um, and there will be time built into the schedule for uh, additional questions at that time as well. Uh, so, so Jesse touched on a, on a lot of this um, as far as the rationale for uh, the CIP goes, as far as the data inventory. Uh, but the first part is really development of your CIP through the comprehensive needs assessment. And, and what the data inventory is, is a tool to really organize all of that data um, that a lot of you, as Jesse stated, have been collecting all along you know, because comprehensive needs assessments have been required for, for several years. Um, it's also where we can link goals and change ideas within your CIP uh, to the rationale that you provide within the data inventory. Uh, so when we're approving plans, uh, we want to see that rationale uh, aligned with your goals and change ideas that you are implementing. And then, again, that data inventory is organize all that data and rationale you use to, again, drive all of the work within your CIP. Um, so it makes sense to have a tool to organize all that so um, we can look at it here at the Agency of Education very easily. And as Jesse said, if you have a data inventory tool that you're using, uh, because I know a, a few of you that do, um, Feel free to upload that if it meets um, all of the intent. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about was um, a change uh, on how you will be completing your CIPs this year. And this is uh, from a strong request from the field that we've had over the past few years. And that is uh, uploading a template into GMS. So what this means is when you now go into GMS, you will not see those narrative sections where you have to fill in, or a lot of you have said in the past, uh, copy and paste, a lot of the work that you're doing outside of GMS into GMS. So now you can take the uh, CIP template, which is posted on the continuous improvement webpage for the Agency of Education. You can complete that template. There has been really minimal, no changes to that template that you've been working on for the past few years. Uh, upload that te template directly into GMS. And I will show you what that um, upload tab looks like in a second. Um, for some of you, there may be concerns about accessing past uh, continuous improvement plans. Um, those will still be housed in GMS, so you can go back and, and look at the work you've done in the past and providing those narratives. Um, just want to let everybody know that all sections of the template, just like with the narratives that you provided in the past, um, should be completed. And kind of a big change that we, we talked about last year that would be coming in the previous year was uh, needing school-specific CIPs. Uh, so SU and SDs uh, have right their CIP. They can share specific goals with the school, uh, but what we want to see is change ideas specific to that unique school and their unique situation. Um, so not a lot of uh, exact copy and pasting of plans or those replicas. 
uh, will be allowed this year. And that's something I'm actually going to go through um, in the next tool I'm going to uh, present to you, which is the uh, CIP review checklist. So when you walk into GMS, data, uh, Jesse showed uh, the data inventory tab. There will also be a CIP template tab, upload tab there, and that's where you simply um, choose the file, choose the CIP template that you've completed, and upload that into GMS. Um, as with the data inventory, um, there will be uh, specific instructions. They just have not been completed or loaded here into GMS, but they will by the time uh, CIP needs to be uploaded. So now I want to walk through um, some expectations and reviews. So we've developed a uh, CIP review checklist that we wanted to share with you. Um, I'll click on this link right here. Hopefully it should be coming right up. Up in the corner. Make it scroll down. Hold on one second. There we go. So if you click on that link, it brings you to the continuous improvement plan review process on the continuous improvement page. It's housed right below the continuous improvement plan template that it talks about uh, just barely that you will be able to upload. Click on that and it brings you to the PDF of the CIP review process. And here's the tool and what it looks like. So this is a tool that education quality coordinators will be using to review your continuous improvement plan. Uh, the CIP template components are on the left-hand side. Those aligned with all the components you will be filling out within your uh, CIP template. You will see um, the acceptance criteria that we will have. So the first one is, is around the list of stakeholders uh, that you will need to have involved in the process. Um, these are a lot of the requirements that are listed within the education quality standards. And then there's an explanation as what it looks like if you're not meeting um, the components for that specific part of the template. So it will be returned. Um, if you're missing anybody from the participant list or there are no stakeholders listed at all in, in this section, um, like I said before, all, all sections must be complete. Um, I know a question that will probably come up is we did not have any parent involvement. Um, we put out requests for parents. We've advertised for parents to be involved. Um, say we didn't receive any. Is that okay? Please provide that as an explanation. Um, within your, your CIP if that was the case, because I know that has happened to a few of you in the past. Um, and I'm not going to run through the whole thing exhaustively, but you will see the next one is uh, shared vision, which I know all of you from, are familiar with from filling out CIPs in the past, um, who has to be involved in that process. Uh, then there's the data inventory and the data that must be included that, that Jesse uh, went over in his presentation. Uh, the next area is uh, the broad academic areas of focus, so the kind of the analysis of the summary of the data. Um, the problems of practice connected to the data. Again, like Jesse said, a lot of this is going to be connected to the, the data inventory that we will be receiving. So we'll be able to go back to that and look for that rationale. Uh, root cause analysis. Uh, here's one I want to talk about briefly. Um, so we're asking you to upload your cause and effect diagram, for example, um, a wishbone five ways protocol template or, or another protocol that you may be using. Um, and those are specific to our uh, our template, our uh, CNA template on the uh, AOE webpage. If you use a different CNA process, a different comprehensive needs, and I know some of you do, um, we also allow for you to put a narrative of what that root cause analysis may be. So you do not have to specifically upload those tools if you do not use that process. Theory of improvement. So again, if you do use it, upload your driver diagrams that you're working on. Um, if not, provide the uh, the narratives. Um, under this one, you must have at least one academic proficiency goal that has not changed from the past. Um, but we're asking that you have no more than three goals. So like as Jesse spoke to earlier, um, really prioritizing what your top three, two or three goals are uh, within your SUSD or school. 
uh, in a CIP you might be working on behind closed doors outside of GMS, you may have five or six goals. We would like to see your prioritized goals uh, for this process. And again, as Jesse said, part of the, the, the design of the data inventory tool is so you don't have to cover so many goals within your CIP um, to feel like you have to meet investment needs. Uh, so another area I've already talked about is the school-specific CIP. Uh, so we want to see that plan if it does not have school-specific change ideas and measures. Again, we will be returning that and, and asking for, for your input on, on why that's so. Um, but again, they can have the same goals. We just want to see you know, change ideas specific to that school's unique needs based on the comprehensive needs assessment and rationale in their own data inventory. And then the last one, oops, sorry about that. The last one we'll be looking at is uh, around schools eligible for comprehensive supports and equity support. So we wanna make sure that your CIP and schools eligible for those supports have a goal, strategy, or change idea that addresses the reason for eligibility. All right. And Josh, just uh, for clarification, the CIP checklist that you, you've just been walking us through, it's effectively a rubric that the AOE is going to be using when reviewing the CIPs, and we're sharing this now so that the, 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 yep. the schools know what, what the, the criteria are for being, um, for being reviewed. Yeah, we want to, we want to be as, as, as transparent as possible um, to let everybody know up front again, yes, uh, what we will be reviewing and if we uh, return CIPs, um, why they're being returned. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so one thing I wanted to show you real quick was, well, I did show you this, but what the CIP upload tab looks like, again, instructions will be to follow. Um, and that kind of completes the, the review of the uh, CIP checklist that we'll be using. Um, but I wanted to go over with you briefly kind of the timeline for, for all this work and what that looks like. So CIP and data inventory submissions will begin on February 15th. That's when GMS will be open for you guys to go ahead and make those submissions. Uh, between February 15th and March 15th, um, is when CIPs submitted will be reviewed by the education quality coordinators in advance to the April 1st opening of the CIP application. So we will guarantee that we will review them prior to that April 1st opening. Um, if we do return a plan, we may have to go back and forth some time to, to get those plans up to speed and approvable, um, but we will do our best to approve those by April 1st, but we will certainly review them um, so you can be, they can be ready and approved for the April 1st um, opening of the CFP application. And, and I do wanna mention that there is no deadline for submissions for CIPs, um, just that no CFP applications will be reviewed until you have approved SUSC and school level CIP. Um, another thing is CFP applications should be submitted by um, June 30th to be considered substantially approved for the July 1st start of the fiscal year. Um, that's no different than in the past. Um, I think that's it as far as the timeline goes. Yep. And uh, let me just briefly remind people, this is Jesse, of, of what substantial approval means. If you are substantially approved, it means your superintendent has hit the submit button and your application has come to us either before July 1 um, or after July 1, depending on which one happens. Let me say that again. So substantial approval basically allows you to begin obligating funds, not to expend, but it means you can start entering into agreements for spending. Um, if you submit before July 1, you will be substantially approved on July 1, which means at the start of the fiscal year, you will be able to begin obligating funds. You aren't necessarily fully approved yet. That still needs to go through our process here on the AOE side, but you are able to begin obligating funds with original submissions on or before July 1. If you submit after July 1, your initial application, you will be substantially approved on that date. So my advice to use sort of a loose deadline is really June 30, July 1, to have your applications in so that they're substantially approved 
and you can begin obligating at the very start of the fiscal year. This is of particular importance for people who are conducting summer activities. Maybe it's part of your summer school. Maybe it's for PD opportunities that will happen in advance of the school year. It's really valuable to have substantial approval right on July 1. So try to submit before that date so that when July 1 hits, you are immediately substantially approved to begin obligating funds. Any other questions, Patrick? I'm at the questions point of our. There have been no other questions added into our uh, into the chat right now. Um, let's take a second to to let folks you know add those questions so that we can address what's going on. Um, while they're doing that, I do want to remind people what Josh said earlier that next Friday, which I believe is the seventh of February, um, us will be at the the Vicla meeting. Um, doing a short presentation um, and really using it as a chance to, to answer additional questions that might have come up after people have had a chance to review the data inventory, review the CIP checklist, um, and, and the like. Correct. One question just came is, uh, what happens if the data inventory is submitted after the 15th of uh, February? So uh, I'll jump on this one. So again, there's no hard deadline for the submission of your data inventory or your CIP. You need to have both submitted for your schools and LEA in order for the CFP team to review your application. So until we see that you've got all your SIPs in, until we see that you've got all your data inventory in, you're really not gonna kind of be in our queue. Once you have all those things submitted and then you've submitted an application after April 1st, then we'll go ahead and we'll begin processing your CFP application. So there's really, there's no penalty other than your timeline continues to push out a little bit with that sort of soft deadline of June 30 in mind. It probably makes most sense to have those done early because as you all know, you know, that period of the year can be pretty, pretty fast and furious for us on the CFP time. On the CFP side, you know, reviews can take a few weeks, especially initially when we're really doing an in-depth dive into what you've asked for. We're looking at your data. You've maybe got 60 or 70 new investments we need to look over. Earlier is going to be better if you want to be if you want to be all set to be substantially approved for July 1. Jesse, one thing that just came to mind that could be a question that's in uh, some people's minds is um, the status of the annual snapshot. Mm -hmm. And the annual snapshot is a way to inform the continuous improvement plan that people might be using or to use as data for the uh, to be included in the data inventory. At this point, we are in a little bit of a delay. We had a couple of districts that ran into some technical problems and uh, led to some sort of, you know, led to a delay. So the latest version of the annual snapshot right now is scheduled for release um, in the spring. I, the spring is a, a fairly large window. We don't have an exact date for it right now. We understand that that's not ideal. Uh, schools should have access at least to their SBAC data uh, through, the, through the portal there. Um, but you won't have access to the 1819 data that was that, that will be fully included in the uh, annual snapshot until sometime in the spring. Um, it certainly could be um, you know included in the the CIP, but that would probably push people back beyond April one uh, mm -hmm. for a submission of that. So this is a consideration. Okay, so. Um, that concludes what we've got for you today. Um, I'll, I'll put out there that, that members of my team, members of, of the EQ team are always available for calls and for emails, so please don't hesitate. We know that in some senses this is new, um, though like we said before, a lot of you are already doing so much of this great work and, and we're so thankful for your efforts around continuous improvement planning, around supporting your CFP investments. So please, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to Josh, to me, to members of our teams, um, and, and we'll certainly do our best to be as responsive and, and clear as we can. Um, so thank you so, so much. Happy planning, and uh, we will talk to you all soon. Thank you.